Our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain. This is Iowa Civil Rights History Podcast, where we tell stories about the contribution Iowans and the state of Iowa has made to advance the civil rights movement. Past stories are being told, present actions will be highlighted, and preparation for the future will be discussed. Here is your host, Eric Nyange. Welcome to the Iowa Civil Rights History Podcast. This is bonus episode. It's the bonus episode in the sense that the story you're going to hear didn't happen in Iowa, and the man that's sitting across from me was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. What happened to him? It could happen to anyone in this great nation. That's why I wanted to share his story with you. On September 21st, 2005, a young man by name Kenneth Nixon was convicted of two counts of murder, four counts of attempted murder, and one count of arson was sentenced to life in prison. Ken was just 19 years old. After he spent 15 years and nine months in prison, Ken was exonerated and released from prison on February 18, 2021. The problem with Ken's case, he was innocent of all the crimes he was charged and convicted of. And he claimed his innocence from the beginning. It is a great honor to have him on the show today to talk about his journey and his story. Ken, welcome to the show, bro. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. How you, how you been? How you been? I've been good, man. Detroit is on. Absolutely. Born, born and raised. Absolutely. Have you lived anywhere else besides Detroit? No. No? Not lived, no. Always been Detroit. Okay. Siblings? Yes. How many siblings you got? Um, I've got two brothers, two sisters. Okay, older, younger? One older sister, uh, and everybody else is younger. One younger sister, both of my little brothers are younger. Okay. If I would be in high school with you, or maybe middle school, whatever, how would you describe Ken back then? Wild and? Nah. Cool and collect? Cool and collected, focused. Okay. Um, Middle school, I think middle school was those years that really formed who I became. You know, I was really, really focused in middle school. Um, I was, I guess my family would probably consider me a nerd at that point. Oh, really? I was, yeah, I was I was in the zone. How do you focus in the middle school, man? Because it's like you, most of us in the middle school, we don't even know who we are. Well, I was in magnet schools mm. um, through my middle school years. So everybody in the school was, I guess you can say, above our academic achievements at that point were a bit above average. So, you know, we were doing stuff. And when I say it, it formed who I am, like those are people that I really call friends. Like those are people that have stuck with me through the worst. You know, that's where I really built those lifelong relationships yeah. and, you know, really staying focused on, you know, we kept each other focused on our classwork, our homework. Uh, you know, we hung out together afterwards, you know, on the weekends. Kind of held that each was, other's accountable. Exactly. Interesting. Interesting. Mom, pops? Absolutely. Moms. Uh, my stepfather was there since I was a kid. You know, okay. He's still around. Uh, mom's been there every step of the way. Yeah. By the time you're 19, you started business. Yes, sir towing company yes, sir. you bought a home yes sir come on you gotta tell me something bro because i mean <laughs> at the time of, i was 19 i was not thinking about none of that i did not even understand how the real estate game worked well what, what where's the game what what does what this knowledge come from for you i've always been i've always hung around older people mm. you know i like to be around people that i can learn from okay i like to be around people that are giving with information that that are forthcoming with it and and don't mind sharing, educating you on stuff that you don't know anything about. So the company kind of came into play. I've been around towing my entire life. My grandfather owned a towing company for 30 plus years. Oh, so that's where it came from. That's where it came from. I've been around it my entire life. It was something that I wanted to do, you know, as I got older. So that's where I kind of picked it up. Okay. And then, you know, once I reached that age where I can do it myself, being around it, it was like, all right, I can do this. You, uh, you know, yeah. I, I can figure this out. And that some older guys, you know, walked me through the process of getting the company started. And my business partner 
really, really believed in me. He bought me my first truck and was like, yo, we'll oh, figure really? the rest out later. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. So was that one of your dreams as a, as a kid to start your own business? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I've, I've always struggled with Working for somebody. Working for somebody. Everybody, I, practically everybody I know is an entrepreneur. My mom's done hair her entire life. Oh. You know, my grandfather owns a towing company. Okay. So, you know. So you coming from that. Exactly. The, oh. Okay. Everybody that I looked up to was an they, entrepreneur. They okay. So there was no way out for you. Exactly. You, you had to. Exactly. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. My path was pretty much inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna be a business owner you're not gonna be working for anybody Indeed. what 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 other uh dream did you have when you're in middle school high school and any any anything you was like man i wanna i wanna do that i mean beyond beyond being successful the only other thing that i ever wanted to be was a father oh that was that was one thing that i don't know what it was you know i like kids i enjoy kids so that was one thing where i felt like I could really give my all into. That's crazy. That's crazy because most of us, we become a father. It's just like, oh, oh okay. You just, you just, oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks for the news. Yeah. Yeah. Now I got to wait for the next eight, nine months. <laughs> but you wanted actually to be a father. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. crazy. And you got two boys now. I do. I got two boys. 18 and 17? Uh, 18 and 19. 18 and 19. Yeah. Uh, why did you want to be a father? Like I said, my stepfather's been a staple in my life since I was a kid, but not really knowing my own, you know, caused me that want. I guess in the back of my mind, I just wanted to be better. You know, I wanted to be better. I wanted to set the record straight that this ain't the way it's supposed to be. Mm. Okay. So you never met your pop? No, not. I mean, I've met him on the phone, but... Nah, face nah, to okay, face, face to, nah, okay. Not since I was a kid, okay. I mean, not that I can remember. How how you think that impacted your life coming up? I don't think it did. Oh, okay, since your stepfather was yeah, was I, there, I don't think it did. I, yeah. I think it was more so. I mean, as a kid, I had everything I wanted, so yeah. it wasn't that. I mean, don't now, nah, don't get me wrong. Don't don't overstate that part. Like, yeah, we struggled. <laughs> you know, we had our moments. We we struggled. You yeah, know? yeah. But at the same time, you know, I didn't know we were broke. I didn't know we were in Because that's all you knew. That's all I knew. Yeah, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, But when I say I had everything I wanted, like, I mean it from the place of, you know, when I needed stuff, I got it. It was never a day that we went hungry the entire day. We we struggled. We had yeah. We definitely had those times just yeah. like everybody else. <laughs> but, again, you don't – I didn't know the difference. Until you get out your environment, you'd be like, oh. Yeah. I should be getting that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But nothing was out of reach. You know, yeah. everything was was attainable. And, you know, my mom, my stepfather, you know, they beat it in your head. You work hard enough, you can have whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we kind of, that's how I approach life. Like, whatever that, it put is. Put that like, work in. Exactly. Put yeah. that work in. At that time, especially the city like Detroit, there's a lot of things going on. It's so easy for the young man to get caught up on the street. Absolutely. You didn't. True. Who kept you off the street? I mean, it was a little bit of everybody. Yeah. You know, strong will. At me being strong will and the community. You know, life is a little different now. It, it, the community don't do what they used to do. Yep. Back when True. I was coming up, the community made sure that I was straight. Okay. You know? And the older guys in the neighborhood were really the ones like, nah, that ain't for you. You can't do that. Yeah. You can't do that. You know, they, they see me stepping off into something that I ain't got no business you know, they corrected me. You know, they 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 grabbed a hold of me and sent me home. Yeah, nah, that ain't for you. Okay. You know? How how much of that is your that middle school time when you say, man, I'm focused, I'm on my zone. How much of that had a lot to do with it? Like, yeah, I don't want to get caught up in this because I know exactly where this go. That had a lot to do with it. Mm-hmm. That had a lot to do with it because while everybody else was outside being distracted, I was home or at somebody's Writing house. Business doing, plan. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, doing homework or yeah. plotting my next move. Yeah. So, yeah, it definitely, it, it played a major factor in, you know, whether or not I stepped off into the street. i always been different. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. i always been different. i always been the, the, the guy that was, you know. Take I his didn't, own path. Exactly. You know, I growing up, I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. Oh, for you real? Know, I didn't, yeah, I wasn't, yeah. you know, the corner guy. That wasn't me. That ain't my, that ain't my space. H- how tough was that? Because being your own man, man, it's a whole different ball game. You got to stand on your own path. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was, 
it was tough at first. It was tough at first. Until but the, you get comfortable. I got exactly. I was comfortable saying no. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And not only that, my peer pressure came from people that loved me and respected me. So, you know, my no meant no. You know, it wasn't yeah. no, I'm going to push you into doing it or I'm going to pressure you into doing it. They understood yeah. that I had said no for so long. It was like, man, we ain't even going to try to do it no mm-hmm. more. <laughs> and, 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 and you know what I learned about on that, though? Uh, I learned that people respect it. Absolutely. People respect it. Like, oh, this cat has his own path, man. He He's his own man. Yeah. I want to get to the 2005. Mm-hmm. On September 21st, and correct me if I, I get my dates wrong, because sometimes Google don't do you no good. <laughs> <laughs> so on, on September 21st, 2005... The state of Michigan convicted you of two counts of murder, four counts of attempted murder, and one count of arson. And you were sentenced to life in prison without parole. Yes, sir. The problem was, and the problem still is, you did not commit the crime. Correct. But the state of Michigan say, no, I think we got the right guy. But actually, they had the wrong guy. Correct. Take me back. The crime happened on May 19th. Mm -hmm. You got arrested the same night. Mm -hmm. Hours later. Hours later. I mean, them Detroit detectives are real good on their job. Yeah. I I mean, (laughs) (laughs) that's the most quickest turnaround. Now, there was a gasoline bomb Mm -hmm. that was thrown in uh, Naomi Vaughn. Two children got killed on that. Immediately. They got their attention to you mm-hmm. and actually arrested you, and you ended up spending 15 years and nine months in prison for the crime you did not commit. Yes. You say something was profound about the criminal justice system. You say, in America, we are taught the system works as it's supposed to. Yes, sir. If police don't get it right, the court will get it right. You're assuming the logic will play itself out. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly... That is a very accurate statement. As Americans, we are taught that the system works the way that it's supposed to. We are, I mean, we champion our system across the world as the best. The best, yep. We <laughs> claim that it's, it's, there's no other system better but, than they, ours. They, they, yep. But the reality is there's gaping holes yes. to it. <laughs> is, is that what was going through your mind when you got arrested that night? When I got arrested... They initially didn't tell me why I was being arrested. But when they finally told me, I figured I'm good. Because I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I don't even know what the hell y'all talking about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, impossible for this to go very far. You know, I'm thinking in my mind, they're going to figure this one out. Like, they've got to figure this one out. Impossible. Yeah, that's that's what my thought process was. When did it click in your mind like, oh, I got a problem. This is real bigger than I thought. I think the day my attorney came and told me that they were introducing a jailhouse informant into the case, that was the moment I knew I was going to prison. Because at that moment, I knew and I understood that they were willing to do anything to win, even if that meant cheating. So you realize this is not about justice anymore. That was the moment I realized. It's about winning. Exactly. What are you thinking about the criminal justice system today? I think it's severely flawed, and most Americans don't know about the flaws. And police and prosecutors act in that space of ignorance. Mm. They know that most people don't know or don't understand the way the system works. Mm -hmm. And I think they take advantage of that because nobody knows. Yeah, Nobody knows, and there's no accountability for it. So... In that space, I can do what I want. Nobody's going to say anything, and there's no consequences for it. And I was I was one of those guys about all up to eight, maybe, or nine years ago. I really, really believed you had done something. How did they even get to you? And so I was in that group. Police can be trusted 100%, and the judge is going to be doing their job. The jury is going to be doing their job. The prosecutor, why would the prosecutor send somebody to prison? Yeah, don't come to Detroit with that mindset. <laughs> <laughs> don't come to Detroit with that mindset. Yeah, You're going to wind up with a prison number. Oh, yeah. How do you think they sleep at night? 
when you've done something for so long and there's no consequences, right? There's a, there's a term that police use. If you get away with something for so long, it emboldens you. Most people don't start off smoking crack or heroin. They start off with something else and they graduate, <laughs> yep. right? So that same terminology applies to police and prosecutors. I, you, you're not going to convince me that police detectives just started being crooked when he became a homicide detective. No. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. He, he started 20 years ago, back when his career first started. So, I mean, the the, the the buddy system applies in this situation, too. If we friends and we grew up together, we spent the last 20, 30 years working together, I'm not going to go against you. Yeah. What you tell me, I'm going to take it at face value because I trust exactly. you're going to deliver me the right answer. So, mm -hmm. you know, once you start to build that relationship, it's hard to tear that relationship down. That's what happens in the justice system where you have police working so closely with prosecutors that they build a friendship. Yeah. Most judges are former prosecutors. So, so there's no I'm not separation going, of power there. Exactly. You know, I'm not, me and you grew up in the prosecutor's office together. I go off to become a judge. I'm not going to go against you. Yeah. How do we fix that? I think it got, it, it has to start with accountability until there's some accountability for some of the stuff that's happening within the system. Until we can get to that place, until we can get to a place where people admit that they are wrong and that they've made a mistake, I don't know that we can. Because, yeah, there's monetary damages that come with, with, with these cases and these lawsuits and this stuff, right? But, but it's not hitting their pockets, though. That's it's, exactly it's what I was city. about to say. It, and it doesn't even hit the city. The insurance company pays it. Yeah. So it, it technically, it, who is it really affecting? The yeah. only thing that a, that a huge lawsuit affects is public perception. That's it. People get to see. Yeah, we see. We, yeah, oh, yeah, want so a lot they, of money. Yeah, they want a lot of money. But the reality is behind the surface that cops keeps his job. That prosecutor still got his job. They both still have their pensions. Mm -hmm. They're going to retire like nothing's wrong. Do you think we need to start holding them personally accountable? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. If, they're, if they had to sacrifice their pensions or if they had to sacrifice their retirement funds or if they had to sacrifice – Something that penalized them in a way, I think it would, would definitely change the decision-making process. They'd be more aware of the effects of their decision-making. Where is the judge come into it? The judge is supposed to be the gatekeeper. But in reality, how often does that really happen? As long as there's no consequences, it will for, keep going. it's going to keep going. I want to go back to the case. Did you know Naomi at that time? When this whole thing started? I knew of them. She and I had never had any, you know, one on one interaction with each other. I yeah. knew of her through Rico. Okay. Rico was, you the know, the boyfriend of family that. friend. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, he and I were friends. We hung around. Okay. So she that's how she comes into play. You know, I didn't know her. Okay. I didn't even know her last name until I seen it in the paperwork. <laughs> So that tells you how much she yeah. and I conversated. You know, I didn't even know she had that many kids until yeah. I seen it in the paperwork. So, no, I did not know her, know her. Yeah. Have you even been at the house before that? No. No. Oh, wow. That's crazy. So the, the crazy thing is you got charged and your girlfriend at the time also got charged the same yes. crime. When she got acquitted, you yeah. thought, hey, this thing is over. Kind if she sense. didn't do it, how could I? I mean, this, this takes you back to my previous <laughs> point of logic, right? <laughs> if, if your theory is that she drove me there and she got acquitted, then how did I get there? <laughs> I mean, that, uh, logic, right? Yeah, yeah. Logic. I mean, the, the, you, you would think, because I, I, I was thinking the same thing when I heard you talk about this in another interview. You said, man, hey, which... To me, I thought about the same thing. Oh, yeah, she got acquitted about the same charges that I'm charged in. Well, I'm about to go home. Yeah. And then they came back to you say, no, 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 not too fast. Yep. You're going to prison. Yep. I think once once that verdict came back, I was just in a dark space. Like I bet. Nothing made sense at that point. Nothing. How angry were you? I don't even think I was angry. It was more so not understanding. How could this happen? Yeah. I couldn't process what was happening to me. Yeah. You know, for my entire life, I was taught that, you know, logic. If you just apply a little logic to mm -hmm. it, you know, if it don't work when you turn it left. It's got to work when you turn it right. You know, for so long, I've been taught that. 
And for this to happen, and, you know, my thinking at that time was like, whoa, this is heavy. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, this isn't a drug case. No. This isn't a gun case. You know, this ain't no probation case. You know, this ain't a stolen car case. Like, this is the whole thing. Like, wait a minute, what? It it just wasn't making sense. I'm sure your whole family was in the courtroom. Yes. Talk to me. How did your mom, did you even get a chance to turn around to see her? I did not. Honestly, I can't even tell you. Mm. Like, I was I was drawing the blank in that moment. Like, I was busy trying to understand what was happening, you know. So I didn't, I don't even remember turning around. I don't, I can't tell you what was happening behind me. Because I was thinking about her when I was going through and reading your stuff. If I was in your shoes, I think it would crush my mom. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because before this, you never got in any type of trouble. Nope. So it's like you, you're you doing great. You got a lot going on with your life. You got these two boys and your dream becoming a, being a father and just raise them. Boom. And everything just gets snatched off you just like that. Yeah. And that was that was a lot to process. Considering all the positive stuff that I had going on at that time and for this to happen. And for it to play out the way that it did, I was just dumbstruck. Like, I was just dumbstruck trying to figure out, like, how did I go from all of this to here? You know, I'm like, how did I get here? Of all places to be here, you know, and it just, it wasn't making sense. Like, it it just wasn't. They they always say this, everybody walking to prison, they say they're innocent. How hard was it for you to let people know even to find the right people to talk to that hey listen i'm actually innocent or was he one of those man we heard this before oh it was a little bit of both you know i got i got pushed away i got shunned away you know i fell into that gap of everybody says they're innocent absolutely i i dealt with all of that it was extremely hard it took years to convince people to really pay attention and it, it actually it took for me it took for me and my family to gather some evidence. It took a little thinking outside the box. Let's put it yeah. like that. You know, it wasn't just, it wasn't just you call in and, hey, I'm innocent. No, it didn't work like that. You know, I actually had to demonstrate. I had to show, look, I got, there's some issues over here. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I had to get creative and the way I painted the picture, you know, being able to, to be effective with your words, being able to demonstrate that this may be something worthy of looking into a little further. That took years to really develop and really figure out the right way to do it to yeah. get people's attention. That was not a simple task at all. And that that was, did it take you like 10 years to get to that point? Yes. Talk to me. It took me 10 years to get my hands on my police file. Once I got my hands on my police file. It took, when, it, whoa, 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 whoa. it took 10 years to get that information? Yes. The information that sent me to prison, it yeah. took me 10 years to get my hands on it. It's supposed to take 14 days. It took 10 years. Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh-oh. Yeah. What's the excuse? Oh, they didn't have one. They couldn't find it. It didn't exist. They didn't know where it was. Uh, I'm not entitled to it. Pretty much anything that you can think of. Because it's the same police department. Where they were able to get to you two hours after the crime? Exactly. And now they need 10 years? Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the most perfect inconsistency in the planet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. We can get to the suspect. We think he did the crime in two hours. And we filed the paperwork. If you're looking for the paperwork that we filed, it's going to take us 10 years to get back to you. Yeah. Yeah. Was that one of the signs for you? Absolutely. That was, that was most certainly one of the signs because in the back of my mind, Again, uh, I'm a logical person, so I'm thinking in my head, like, what is it that you don't want me to see? What is really your concern with turning this paperwork over to me? Oh, if you really think you got the right guy, you will do that quickly. Exactly. You wouldn't care that somebody was going back over this. It wouldn't make you any difference because you stand on your work. But that wasn't the situation here. But oh, man. Eventually, they sent, they sent you the information you needed. Eventually, they sent me part of the information I needed. Once I got my police file, it still took me another three years to get my prosecutor's file. So altogether, 13 years. 
And that's when things started to take off a little bit. There was some information in both files that really was it inconsistent. Absolutely, <laughs> I, I think inconsistency is is a soft term. There were indications of knowing corruption at that point. Oh boy, yeah. Oh boy. Shortly after getting it, I sent it to a journalism school in Illinois. They agreed to take on my case as a class project. Um, a group of students and some professors came to Michigan, did their own investigation, tracked down a lot of people. They wrote a story based off of their investigation. That story became front page news. Once it became front page news, then the Innocence Project, you know, they jumped on board and the Conviction Integrity Unit jumped on board. And I'm here. Man, God bless the Innocence Project, man. Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Absolutely. Oh, because you will never be getting out. Yeah, there, there's a there's a huge likelihood I could still be in prison right now if it was not for the Innocence Project and the Conviction Integrity Unit. On your sentencing day, man, I hope I'm not going to get choked up. Before you were sentenced, the judge asked you if you want to, if you have anything to say. And you told the judge you're about to sentence innocent man to prison for the rest of his life for the crime he didn't commit. Yes, what, what was the judge reaction? He didn't have one. He just carried on with the proceedings. What was the emotion in the court at that moment? It was quiet. Like nobody was saying anything. Nobody was saying a word. And... It was just one of those moments where like, I didn't know that it was going to make it into the, the, the transcribed record. I didn't know that. I just felt like it was necessary for him to hear me say that. And it was just like it was one of those moments where nothing was happening. Man. What were you feeling at that moment? What was going through your mind? My life is over. Defeated. I felt defeated. I felt defeated in a way that I think I was too young to really understand. You know, like, yeah. like first off, nobody likes to lose. Nobody signs up to lose. That's true. Like, but to lose in a way where it costs you your liberty, where it costs you your freedoms, I was crushed. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to feel. I think I was too emotionally immature to really understand what was going what on. was going on how i was supposed to deal with it it just it wasn't making sense and that your life was about to change forever yeah I, I i could not have imagined what the next steps from that day forward would look like you talk about liberty we talk about that a lot in this country we do i i have freedom to do this i have freedom to do that i don't think most of us understand what freedom is define what freedom means for ken before arrest and what freedom means to Ken today. Freedom before arrest was I can go and come as I please. I didn't have to answer to nobody. In my head, I was older than what I really was. You know, I was I was doing things that people weren't doing at my age. So I was doing me. That's what my freedom meant. Then, mm -hmm. you know, I was doing I me. do what I do. Yeah, I change it when I want to change it. That was pre arrest. Post arrest can, you know, after exoneration can, my freedom's a bit more measured now. You know, my decisions are a bit more measured. And I want to make sure that my every decision is impactful and meaningful, not only to myself, but to other people. You know, that that's extremely important to me that in order for my life to have value, I bring something to somebody else. I think pre arrest I it was all about me pre-arrest. Mm. You know, I mean, you were 19. Yeah. It's just like I was I was in my zone at 19. <laughs> I was in my zone. I was I was doing me. But at that particular moment, I was a young adult. I was trying to figure out life. Nobody else mattered. You know, none of that meant anything. Mm -hmm. Nothing had true meaning cuz, you know, a, as a young adult, everything is subject to change, yep. you know. What I like today, I might not like tomorrow. So, I was figuring that part of life out. Now, yeah. though, my every ounce of existence is based off of doing something good for the next person. 
I don't ever want anybody to have to experience what I went through. That's a pain that I don't want to see anybody have to experience, regardless of, you know, what we agree or disagree on. That's a level of pain that I don't want to see anybody have to go through. 15 years and nine months in a cage for something you did not do. People who committed a crime, they go to prison, they, they go crazy. Mm-hmm. You are the person who did not commit crime, mm-hmm. and you're in there with the real killers. How do you navigate through that? And then you look your surrounding and you say, man, I'm trapped in here. I think the first part of that answer is that old Navy SEAL mantra, you adapt and overcome. When you go into a prison setting for that first time, there is no instruction manual. Mm -hmm. They don't tell you what you should and shouldn't be doing. You know what I'm saying? So you're left to your own devices to figure out right from wrong, left from right, what you should and shouldn't be doing. To your next point about, you know, being in there with real killers, I mean, at the end of the day, they're people. Mm. They're people just like everybody else, you know. Most majority of of people that are in prison are there for the first time. And majority of those first-timers, whatever happened was probably a mistake. There's not a lot of people in, in prison that whatever they did to send them to prison was intentional. And you learn that. You learn that talking to people and just being in the environment. You treat prison the same way you treat your neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know who to stay away from. You know who's always into the trouble. You know who to who's doing the schoolwork. You know who's reading the books. Mm -hmm. You know who's reading the magazines. Who's got a subscription to the newspaper. You know, the more you occupy yourself with positive things, it's hard for negativity to seep into your universe. So that's kind of, you know, how I dealt with it for all those years. I buried myself in positivity. You know, I was the guy in the law library. I was the guy reading books. I was the guy, you know, doing uh, crossword puzzles and, you know. What were you reading in there? Everything, man. Everything. There was a point in there where, I mean, it didn't even have to have a, a, a dust cover on it. If it was a book, I picked it up. Just pick it up. You know, it would burn it really, time. Exactly. You don't realize how much time you actually yeah. pass yeah. reading the book sometimes. And especially if it's a good book, mm. you know, you look up and it's four hours later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You still reading. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I didn't always pick and choose yeah. what I read. Sometimes it was just reading for the sake of reading, but, you know, legal books. Love a good story, you know, a good storyline. Keep you focused. Keep you keep your mind occupied for a minute. A you, little bit of everything. You pick you pick some knowledge while you're in there. Oh, most certainly. Oh yeah, most certainly. You know, I read a lot of psychology books. I read a lot of English books. I read a lot of books written by lawyers, evidence based books. I was always looking to learn something, you know. And when I say learn something, I don't mean it from the perspective of it's got to be some sort of you know, educational knowledge. I mean it from the place of, you know, reading books, you'd be surprised how many new words you yep. cross over. You know oh, what yeah. I'm saying? Just oh, yeah. the small stuff is what's oh, yeah. meaningful sometimes. Now, did you believe in God before going in? Absolutely. Did you? Yeah. How much did that uh, help you to stay focused? Or maybe did you question, like, God, are you really there? Because this is the time I need you the most. Oh yeah, me and the big homie, we definitely had a, 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 a conversation. A, we we most certainly had a contentious relationship from time to time. <laughs> you know, we, we yeah. had our beefs, we had our fights. Oh you know, yeah, we talked it out, but it, it played a, it played a huge role in keeping my sanity. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? mm-hmm. It played a huge role, mm-hmm. and and you know, for me, it was really it wasn't even about the religious part of it. It was just. You know, me asking questions and, and searching for answers. You yeah. know, why me? Of all the stuff I had going on, why you pick me? Again, that's one of those questions I'll never get the answer to, but I most certainly asked. We had several conversations down that line. <laughs> oh, yeah. So do, do, you, do you think your belief in God was strengthened through this process or was weakening? I think there were stages. Okay. I think there were stages. In mm-hmm. the beginning... Oh, we was beefing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Me and the big homie, we was beefing. It, it <laughs> back took, to back. Yeah. It took me years to really grow out of that stage of just being angry and mm. disgruntled. You know, it took years to get past that. Yeah. But once I did, it was like stuff started to happen that 
it can only be explained by it being an act of God. Mm. You know, 10 years trying to get some papers. You know, the moment that that showed up, I was like, come on, there's, I've heard every excuse in the book about why they wouldn't give me this file. Like something or somebody had to intervene here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the, again, with the journalism students, I'd been on that waiting list for almost six years. And the timing of everything, when I Make say it was thing. back to back, it was just like, in the back of my head, I'm like, okay, this is your moment. You it's, know not, what I'm saying? it's not coincident. Yeah, exactly. You know, it, it, there's a Jeezy line that I was just listening to a couple of days ago, and he was like, you know, nobody can tell me I rushed the process. I waited my turn. Oof. That's cold. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, you think about when we started this interview, right? Mm-hmm. I'm number 28. I watched 27 people go before me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I watched 27 people go before me. But to that point, it was another turn. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what I kept thinking. It just ain't my turn. But as all of that was happening, as those 27 were having their moment, man was coming. Oh, yeah. He had to clear the way. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And my stages of success continued to get better. You know, first it came to journalism. Then it came to newspaper. Then it came to Innocence Project. Then it came to CIU. Then it came, you know what I'm saying? My process started to take its own course at that point. So I guess I had to wait my turn. We never wait for God. God is always waiting for us. Absolutely. Because he's always ready. Yeah. I'm finding hard to say you can learn a lesson 15 years and nine months behind bars for something you did not do. Mm-hmm. What lesson in there? What, what did you learn? The lesson that I learned was... And that 15 years and nine months that I didn't waste a day of it. Oof. I spent every moment preparing for this moment. Run that back. Run that back. Because we are wasting so much time out here. Run that back. In 15 years and nine months. I didn't waste a moment. I spent every minute preparing for this moment right here. So when people, you know, when people look at me and they, they see what Ken has become, in the year that I've been home, when, when people see that, they look at that and, you know, they say, oh, you've accomplished this or you've accomplished that in one year. I've been ready. I was waiting. Yeah. It wasn't my turn. Oof. When my turn came, I seized the moment. <laughs> this is what so happens when, when, when preparation meets opportunity. I was prepared for my moment. The opportunity presented itself and I took it. So the lesson you're giving us right now, Ken. We're wasting so much time on this social media every minute, every day, and we're not changing nobody's life. None. None. That is an absolute true statement. That is an absolute true statement. While you spending time on social media, there's somebody on death row right now that needs you. Ooh. You can just write them a letter. That's it. That's all it takes sometimes. Sometimes all it takes is one person to believe in you. Ooh. Be that one person. Wow. And you can just write people letters randomly. Yeah. There's nothing preventing you from writing anybody. There's nothing preventing a prisoner in any part of this country from receiving mail from you. And all it takes is one person. Your your one letter could change somebody's life. Man. Man. Uh, wow. They, they make it even easier. You don't even have to hand write a letter no more. You can write an email. You can oh, yeah, send a picture you from your phone. Hey, you don't you don't even have to stop doing what you're doing. If you if you put that same energy into sending somebody an email, how can you go wrong? And I mean you can send somebody a picture of anything that is outside. They they might appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. There's places in this country in prisons where you can't see outside there's places that are walled in with brick walls so you can't see a tree or a car wow besides what you see on tv most people some people in prisons don't even know what a new car looks like and that what's what's crazy about that statement is if you sent a person a picture in prison it don't got to be your car it, it doesn't have to be your car it could be the Corvette you seen driving past on the freeway. Just take a picture. Just take a picture. Take a picture. It's going to cost you less than 10 cents and less than 10 minutes of your life to make somebody's day. 
and give somebody hope. And give somebody hope. And we out here arguing about Elon Musk buying a Twitter. <laughs> man. <laughs> I'm, t- I'm telling you, man. Oh, man. There's a fight of you getting out of prison. Mm-hmm. Once you get out here, also there's another fight mm-hmm. to clear your name. Please explain to me when the court already say Ken is innocent, why should Ken go another two days before his record is either wiped clean or expunged? What's going on there? The system. The system is what's going on there. So so is your record expunged right now or not? No. I still am walking this earth as a free man. With two murder convictions, four attempts, and one count of arson on my background check right now. So there's nobody in this in this country right now who will hire you if you look if you go looking for a job. I mean, I, I've got to jump through some hurdles to get approval, but yeah, pretty much. And when you run a background check, you're going to see two first degree murder cases, four counts of attempted murder, and one count of arson. How do we fix that? In my mind, I'm thinking the moment you walk out of the prison as a, as a free man, as innocent man, mm-hmm. I think the next three days we can give the government that much time to clean up your record. Why should it take that much time? Do you're yeah, right. You're right. The they thing, can do before even you walk out. Exactly. That's what That's I was true. about to say. They process the paperwork for you to get out. That should be a part of the packet, but it's not. It's not. What's the excuse? They don't have one. That's the way the law's written. How do we fix that? Talking to legislators, getting people. Most people don't even know that this happens. Most people are unaware that this is actually a thing. Most people look at me and see what I'm doing and think. You're good. You're clean. You're good. You're clean. No. If I got pulled over right now and I had to give a cop my ID, oh yeah, it's going to show Two murder cases, four attempts, and, and, you might, you, mm-hmm. and you might end up getting shot. I was just about to say, can you imagine how that conversation is going to go when he comes back from his car and he realizes wh- who he's got stopped? Oh, the safety button is going to be off. Oh, most certainly. That's crazy. Because yeah. to me, that's a, that's the easy fix. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what kind of hurdles you got to go through to have that taken care of? Or is, 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 do we know other exonerees that they have that cleaned up? I know some that have gotten it cleaned up, and I'm, I know some that have. Uh, it's cleaned up in multiple different ways. In Michigan, um, when you're approved for compensation, then that's when it's cleaned up. Once the compensation is approved, they order your record to be expunged. You're good. I've also seen people hire private attorneys to file a motion with the court and ask the court to order your records. Destroyed. Yeah, we we don't want to do keep doing more hiring on this one because I mean it's that's that deal has already been done. Yeah. Okay, so we gotta talk to our lawmakers. Most certainly gotta talk to the lawmakers. And you probably cannot even when you you came home you probably could not even get the ID that fast. Oh no. It took me three months to get an ID. <laughs> it took me three months to get a, get a state ID. Which, when you think about that, and, and let's put that into context for a second. I've been in the custody of the state oh. of Michigan for a decade and a half. But now that I'm free, I got to reprove to the state of Michigan <laughs> that I'm the person that you've been holding in your custody for a decade and a half. Make that make sense. <laughs> I got to prove to you that you had me all these years. Wow. So was the case ever been solved? No. No? They don't know who did it. But they had some ideas, though, even in the beginning. Yeah. They had quite a few ideas. Even but, in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk about forgiveness. Uh-huh. It's the conversation I think most of us, we usually talk about it when nothing wrong has been done to us. But forgiveness is, is, is one of the hardest things even I struggle with. It. How did you, or even if you did, walk me through the process? And I'll start with Brandon, because that's when the ball started rolling. If you ever forgave him 
and when did you do it and how did that come about? Because this is the young man who told the detective that he saw you Correct. coming out of the car and throw the gasoline Correct. bomb in the house, and that's how the police got to you, and the rest is history. How do you go about forgiving something? I know, I, and I understand he was 10 years old and he was coached. You know, I, I don't think I've ever been asked that question before. Mm. So I don't know. I honestly don't know if, I, if I've reached that place. Okay. Okay. And which, which is fair. It's absolutely uh, fair. I don't, I don't think I hold any grudges or any ill feelings towards him. But I don't know how cordial we could be. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I don't hate him. I yeah. don't dislike him. You know, I, I, I think I understand to some degree the position he was in. The position he was in. Yeah. However, all things considered, how do I explain that to my sons? When all things considered, how do I be that understanding yeah. to my mom? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. So it, it, it's, you know, there's a, a part of me is like, yeah, it is what it is. But the other part of me is why I go so hard in what I do, mm-hmm. right? Because I want you to see this is what you made me. This is a product of your bad decisions. You designed me. That goes in multiple different directions. The cops, yep. the prosecutors, the judge, the judge, the jury, the jury. You know, when, when people see me now, I want them to think, I want them to feel you created that monster. That guy that's on the news calling you out. That guy that's talking in colleges all over the country that's spewing truth to power. You created that monster. Mm. You sent me to college. You didn't send me to prison. You sent me to college. I sat there and I studied. Mm-hmm. I studied. I studied. I studied. And I paid and attention. He, you know what I'm saying? And here comes the monster. Exactly. Mm. You made this. I yeah. didn't ask for this. You closed that casket down on that box. Mm. I didn't ask for that. But I want you to feel it. I want you to feel it. I want you to feel it from the perspective of... I may not be able to punish you physically. But you, every time you see my name. Every time you see my name, I'm going to make it count. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Every single time. Mm. Did you have juries of your peers? By constitution? <laughs> uh, that's one of those elusive terms. <laughs> <laughs> what exactly is a peer? <laughs> what exactly is a peer? Mm. Uh, not at all. Not even close. Not even close. And anger, resentment toward the system? Not at all. No? Not at all. I think, if if anything, I've got more of a burning desire to change it than anything else. How do you get to that place? Awareness. Did you even even have those feelings of anger and resentment? Oh, absolutely. Most certainly. I probably spent the first six months of my incarceration just... Thinking. Just six months? Wow. I'm generally a positive person, so I don't like to dwell in negative spaces for long. So it took me a minute to shake that feeling, to shake that thought. Yo, how did I get here? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It it took me a minute to shake it off. Six months sounds short to you, but it was long to me. You know what I'm saying? Before I realized it, Snow was coming again. Oh man! You know what I'm saying? I I had I had I don't know what the term is, but I had walked through spring and summer without even realizing that spring and summer had came. You know what I'm saying? So when I realized the snow was coming again, that's when it was like, whoa! I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, gotta get switch back it up. up. Yeah. yeah, I gotta get back. This ain't me. Mm. You know, this ain't me. So it, it, it took a second. So was that one of those things? That like, okay. I can be angry and resentful here for the next 10 years. Oh, I can say, okay, this is what it is. I need to figure out the way to get out of this. I think it was the the, the second part of that more than anything. I, I quickly realized to my benefit, 
I wasn't a bad person prior to going to prison. So Mm -hmm. all of those relationships that I built and developed and nurtured over the years as a kid and as a young adult, those relationships meant something to people. So Mm -hmm. I had many people that wanted to help me. They didn't know how to help me. So at some point during the course of that six months, I realized it was my responsibility to be able to tell them how to help me. And that's where things got started to get different for me because I understood that I had a new responsibility. If I was going to help myself, I was going to need the people around me to do it. So I had to read books. I had to go to the library. I had to learn how to communicate better because I needed to be able to tell you how to help oh, me. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. yep. I, I, I'm getting people every single day that are sending me letters or, or I'm calling and they're like, yo, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Yeah. But the thing is, if I can't tell you how to help me. You're not going to know. You're not going to know. One. But two is, who's the only person losing? Mm-hmm. I'm the only person yep. getting the short end of this yep. stick. Yep. When, when you're offering me help and I don't know what to help. Uh, how to tell you to help me. Yeah. I'm the only person losing. Mm-hmm. So I had to develop the cognitive mind state to be able to say, I need you to call this person. Yeah. This is what I need you to say when you get them on the phone. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It took me a minute to get to that place where I could do that. Talking about help, what can a public do in terms of the wrongful conviction? What, how can we, how do we even prevent two things? One, Vote. You absolutely must vote. You might vote in the wrong prosecutor. That's true. Yeah. That, that's always a possibility. But the reality is less than 60% of people actually vote. So that other 40%, even if we got 20%, you could sway one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the thing is vote. Do your homework. Know who you're voting for. A lot of people don't realize is in some cities – when you vote in the mayor, the mayor picks the police chief. Yeah. You see what I'm yeah. saying? A lot of so city do if, that. If you know who your mayor is going to be and what your mayor is about, you can just about pretty much assume what your police what, department what, is going to be like. Mm-hmm. like I mean, uh, but you got to learn that. I mean, you have to learn the way local politics work. And it, it doesn't require a lot of attention. No. It, don't, it don't require you to spend 14 hours a week trying to figure this out. Oh, yeah. A quick Google search of your tell address you. Oh, yeah. will tell you who you're right away. Exactly. Yeah. The one thing that, in my experience, that has worked is always be prepared for your moment. Always be prepared for your moment. You never know when you're going to run into the mayor. That's true. You never know when you're going to run into the police chief. You never know when city council is going to be walking down your street knocking on door. You know, you just be prepared, be prepared for your moment. So from the public perspective, I think the two things that are important is vote and accountability. When people start to ask about accountability, it starts to change the narrative. Yeah. It changes the conversation. We keep seeing visible displays of abuse. Right, We're watching this play out in the news, but all we're doing is talking about it. Let's change the narrative. Let's change the narrative. Ask a few questions. Find out who the important people are and ask a few questions. Plant a seed. That's it. You know, when I was inside, I was doing stuff that my attorneys didn't like. You know, I was reaching out to the media. I was doing things that they didn't technically agree with. And I understood their perspective. But at the end of the day, I have a responsibility at least that's how I felt. I have a responsibility to my friends and my family to show them your time, your money, your investment was for the right reason. Yeah. And the way that you do that is changing the narrative. I needed people to see I'm not a monster. I didn't do what they're saying that I did. Regardless of what my attorneys were saying to me at that time, mm-hmm. I felt like my path was the right direction because it was necessary. It was necessary to make sure that my people stayed engaged. Understand. You and know they understand. And exactly. Yeah. And they understood that all your efforts are being appreciated. They're worth it. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Mm-hmm. They're worth it. Oh, yeah. How did your boys handle that? I think they're still dealing with it. I think they're both proud of me. They both told me that. To my knowledge, I think they've dealt with it I mean, hell, 
technically to them, I'm the cool dad. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I'm the guy that's always up to something good. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm always doing something that ain't nobody else doing. Yeah. So, <laughs> man, you know, I'm a daredevil. I'm yeah. with all of it. Let's yeah. do it. You know what I'm, I'm ready for the smoke. Yeah, I want all the smoke. Let's do it. <laughs> you say you say something about, I think, well, your, your oldest. You say, the state of Michigan throw me in prison when he was in the diapers. Mm-hmm. And I'm coming home, he's changing motors in the car. Mm-hmm. He's in the car a lot? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? They're both car junkies. Oh, really? They're both car guys. So they just got from you? Yeah. I mean, the whole family, basically. Yeah. You guys in the cars. Yeah. Okay. Is that what they, they want to do? Um, The car game is changing a lot. It is. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think they're, I don't think they want to do it from the perspective that, you know, I was doing it when I was growing up. You know, I think they want to do it. I mean, they're, they're still in that kid stage, you know, yeah. they, they, anything that makes the car faster, cooler, you know, tent yeah. windows, yep. you know, loud mufflers. Yeah. They into it from that perspective, you know, they, they're into cut. the show cars, the display cars, you know, that, not getting dirty. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They, they, they definitely not into the getting dirty part of it. Is your oldest who is 19, does he understand it? Like this is the time when you lost yours? Freedom? I think to some degree he does. Yeah. I think to some degree he does. We haven't actually sat down and really had that conversation, you know, but I most certainly think that he's he's more than consciously aware of it, though. That close your eyes and thinking yeah. about it's like next 15 years you're not here. Exactly. Yeah. You missed a lot of part of their life, a lot of part of them growing up. So I'm sure there's a lot of catching up to do. Mm-hmm. Every father wants to be there when their kid pick up the ball for the first time, get on the bike for the first time, and they fall off, pick them up. And for them, they probably do understand, like, yeah, Pops will be here if he, he could. How was that for you? It was hard. I mean, yeah. Those are the moments that harden your heart right there. Mm-hmm. Those are the moments, you know, for, for the people, for the people that are, that listen to this, for the people that can visualize this, those are the moments that make you a callous person right there. Missing those moments are the, those, those are the moments that, that make you a brick wall. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. Cause That's, kids makes us soft. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But you know, when you when you think about this on a larger scale, it's like, how many of those am I gonna miss? Mm. How many of those are gonna pass yeah. that I won't get to see? How long is this gonna last? How long mm. do I gotta suffer through? Yeah, birthday after birthday, Christmas after Christmas, ball game after ball, ball game, game, graduation after graduation. How long? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's before those, you start losing your mind. Exactly. Those are the moments that turn you into a different person. Those are the moments that make you question humanity yeah. right there. That's that's the times when when you when you're ready to conquer the world right mm-hmm. there. Mhm. Yeah, cuz I mean those can be the moment to make you, you know what? I'm ready to go all the way in. Exactly. Cuz there's nothing else here for me. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, man. Man, we're glad you're home, though. For real. <laughs> like, uh, now, you, you've you been traveling a lot. I have. Talking about your story. What is the biggest misconception you run into? Miseducation. Miseducation is, is the hugest. People being misinformed is probably about 90% of what I do. Oh, wow. There are people that don't know what an exonery is. Oh, wow. There are people that don't understand what comes with it. Mm. You know, people don't get what it means to be free. People draw their own conclusions based off of what the media say. Yeah. That part makes it a little difficult to have a conversation with a person when they've already got a preconceived notion of what they think is right. Yeah, police will never get it wrong. Exactly. Exactly. I think there's a part of that, too. 
if you don't know anybody, you never real pay attention to anybody who has been wrong for convicted. And if this conversation never come up in your family, mm-hmm. you would think there's no reform needed. Yep. Yeah, the criminal justice system worked perfectly. Sadly, criminal justice is one of those things that nobody cares about until it touches somebody close to you. And mm-hmm. it, it doesn't make a difference how close that person is. That's when reality yep. sets in. <laughs> yep, yep. There's a lot of things that will get innocent people to be convicted why do you think it's so easy to convict an innocent person? Because the system is stacked one side. And once that person is convicted, it's almost impossible to get him out. This is a true statement. You, I mean, we can boil that down to the numbers and let the numbers speak for themselves. They're approximately, and I, I think my numbers can be off, they're approximately 10,000 convictions a year all over the country. Out of those 10,000, we have a hundred average, 150 exonerations. Wow. So you think about that for a second. 10,000 people are sent to prison. Mm-hmm. And we, in that time, we figure out about 150 yeah. have been wrongfully convicted. That's a lot. Yeah. Even putting handcuffs on the wrong person, that's a problem. Yeah. Forget about conviction. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, right, first off, nobody likes to be accused of something they didn't. They did not do. Oh, it yeah. don't make a difference what it is. Yep. You could have ate the wrong honey bun, and nobody likes to be accused of nope. something. And it don't make a difference who the person is, police officer, judge, normal civilian. It doesn't make a difference. But when you escalate that to a place that you lose your freedom over it, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Power corrupts people, man. Oh, yeah. Power corrupts people. Oh, yeah. And when you get to a place that power has taken over, logic goes out the window. Right and wrong goes out the window. Mm -hmm. Because your entire existence is based around being right. No matter how wrong people tell you you are, I'm right because I know I'm right and I'm going to be right no matter what you say. Yeah. Yeah. What are you reading right now? Nothing at the moment. I think the last book that I read was Blind Injustice by Mark Godsey. Mark Godsey is a former U.S. Attorney General turned Innocence Project attorney. And he's one of those people that had an inherent bias that thought because he was a prosecutor, they always got it right. He took a trip to a college university one year. He ended up having to substitute for a colleague, and that's when... His eyes were open to the fact that they'd sent an innocent person to prison. The book comes from a place of the mindset of prosecutors. Okay. Okay. The same judge that sentenced you to prison that you told him you're about to send the innocent man in pr- for the rest of his life in prison yeah. is actually the same judge who vacated your conviction. Yes, sir. How was that co- conversation like? Did he, did he apologize? Did. Okay. Okay. He did. And that was a huge moment for me. Okay. Um, that moment is when my healing process began. For somebody of that high stature to say I'm sorry meant something to me. Wow. Yeah, I'm glad he did that. Me too. Yeah, I'm glad he did that. I, I want to close out with this. Talk about your organization of exoneree. Organization of exonerees is a group of justice impacted men and women every last one of us were wrongfully convicted my entire board is made up of wrongfully convicted people we are an independent organization that we make our own decisions we don't answer to anybody we're not funded by anybody okay you know, all of our any money that comes in to us comes into us for the work that we do we do a lot as far as criminal justice reform, we travel around the country bringing awareness to severe issues that are associated with wrongful convictions. We do a lot of reentry work. We make sure that people have what they need when they come home. Um, housing, transportation, uh, underwear, yeah. cosmetics, okay. uh, gym shoes, mm. money in their pockets to eat. All of that is where we step in and kind of fill that gap. Okay. So, yeah. All right, my man. I appreciate your time, Ken. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Man. Well, thank you for listening to the Iowa Civil Rights History Podcast. Until next time.
Be safe.